What's up, party people? It's Keys Dan with RadioWhat.com, DJLittleRock.com, coming to you live in a living color from the Radio What Studios. And this is my podcast, What Makes You Famous. It's an extension of the RadioWhat.com internet radio station that I've been running for quite some time. And if you need DJ services, what do I always send you? DJLittleRock.com. One more time, DJLittleRock.com. Check availability, get a free price quote, and maybe you can have me at your next event. You know I like to party with the people. The people need to be entertained. Are you not entertained? Let me entertain you. Today on the program, speaking of entertainment, these are not just entertainers. These are people that build up the entertainers. Uh, I know that there's a familiar uh, voice that's going to be on in your ears in the next few minutes. It's Heston Cleveland. Yes, you know him from other episodes here on the What Makes You Famous podcast, still building his mom and dad, uh, the Cleveland family, making sure that their music stays alive, but also promoting other people's music as well, uh, independent artists. But thankfully, I have another another great voice that I've been wanting to uh, have in my ears, and you're going to get them in your ears as well. Ricardo Love is a jazz singer, amongst other things. I mean, he's played music with a lot of a lot of the greats, and they are uh, they they f- uh, joined forces. Uh, you got Heston Cleveland and Ricardo Love have joined forces, and they've come up with a a little radio show that's uh, online right now, but uh, soon to be. Maybe on the radio, out on the airwaves, and probably on RadioWhat.com. It's called the Indie Hookup. It's a radio show, well produced. I caught it on on the um, YouTube, but there's plenty of other places that you could find it. Uh, iHeartRadio, amongst other things. But the Indie Hookup radio show is is uh, uh it's it's putting the independent artists that uh, contact them. Uh, on on blasts you know making sure that a few more ears come in but uh, you're going to get to hear their story and how they came to be in the next few minutes so stick around let's see this week's shows i have one public show this week my usual friday night gig at the rab in conway arkansas the video dance party karaoke jam yes i said karaoke you're the stars of the show at the rab in conway arkansas they got a full bar the kitchen's open they got good food in the kitchen pool tables 10 diamond style pool tables and in fact, they have a pool tournament on Friday nights. So if you want to try your hand at playing pool and possibly make some money while you're doing it, come on out to the Rab, Conway, Arkansas. And so while you're waiting to sing on stage, and uh, you can dance on the dance floor. they got a nice big dance floor with lots of club lights. It's a good experience. Good people, good times at the Rab in Conway, Arkansas. So excited. So excited to be there almost every Friday night of the year. You'll find me right there at the Rab. Yeah. I mean, I'm easy to find. So uh, if anybody's looking for me, find me on Friday night at the Rab. Usually, (laughs) more often than not. And then on Saturday, Saturday, I think I have a private event, private function. Uh, I don't think it's a wedding this weekend. I think it's like a birthday party or something like that. But uh, I'm kind of excited about that. But unless you're invited, you cannot come. So there you go. Why do I mention it? Because I get to do stuff uh, and, and help people have the best day ever. Uh, you know, thankfully, I'm still able to do this, and I'm excited to be part of the show, a small part of the show. I mean, people are there to see the guest of honor or the bride and groom, and uh, I'm glad that I, I help to entertain them. I become an extension of that of that guest of honor, of those guests of honor, uh, and, I'm, and I get invited to people's houses a lot and people's uh, places of business, and I, I get to uh, I get to play for people. I'm so excited, and uh, it's a great honor, and it's it's um uh, you know I, 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 it's a great responsibility. So I'm happy about that. All right, that's it for the intro. Let's get into it with Heston Cleveland and Ricardo Love of the Indie Hookup. I got them on Skype, so if you're listening to the audio version, I encourage you to check out the video version on my YouTube page, youtube.com forward slash user forward slash Keys Dan. Skyping Heston Cleveland and Ricardo Love. Now, there's a good looking dude on my screen. Let's see if we sometimes. Oh, my goodness. Look at these fine, fine menses on my screen. I got Heston Cleveland, who's an, uh, a friend of the show, a longtime favorite. A lot the 
East Oakland Music Management and Heston's Hits. Now, I saw the hashtag for Heston's Hits, and if you read that real fast, it might look like something else. Okay, okay, but that's a story for another day. I'm gonna let the I'm gonna let the listener, the viewer, whoever, uh, go to your page and look up Heston's hits. <laughs> and then I got uh, my new friend Ricardo Love, man, the uh, the jazz man, amongst other things. And you're uh, you're you're promoting a brand new show called the Indie Hookup. You're uh, a few episodes deep already, and the Indie Hookup. Well, I'm going to let you guys uh, fight it out. Let the people know what is the Indie Hookup. The Indie Hookup is a platform to help independent artists be heard. Um, we are broadcasting on multiple platforms and we are growing. We've been picked up by KYBN every Friday, 5 a.m. Pacific and Eastern is 8 a.m. Um we're on Phenom Radio, we're on My Indie Radio, we're on iHeart, we're on Amazon, we're on YouTube, and a, a number of other uh, smaller podcast outlets. So we've been growing really fast, and we're giving uh, artists the opportunity to be heard. And we try to just pick quality artists. We do believe that um, just because you're independent doesn't mean you can't be professional. So we do require that you hit a certain level a professionalism however if you need help with your mix or fixing vocals we offer that service too yeah well, you're growing really really fast you've only been really producing shows for the past couple of weeks and you put it out there on the youtube this is shows if you take a listen there's production value like crazy you already have shout outs you already have uh drops stingers uh different uh, stuff that you would hear on a very professional very big radio station i've worked for mom and pop stations where i've had to do it all by myself i have some technical ability of making my voice sound bigger and more booming and i can add effects to it but when you have a show that has a budget you get other people to put their voices on there get drops from the artists themselves let them promote themselves it's a well-produced radio show and i cannot imagine that you cannot get picked up uh, by syndication and you've already got some sort of syndication there's already uh, you know you're already out there at 5 p.m pacific time on a on a pretty major radio station from what i understand out there on the west coast west side and, uh, you know, but I'm so excited that you're that you're taking off. You know, some people uh, would hate the idea that you've been such an overnight success. But a lot of people think overnight success. You've already been doing it for years and years and years. This is the product of all the knowledge that you've been accumulating over your years. You're not like you're not straight out of high school. You're not young youngsters. You've been around the block a few times. Heston, yes, sir. You've already told me stories about you know you bringing up uh, not just your mom and dad story. That's something that you do out of love, out of passion. You know, uh, making sure that Carrie oh, Cleveland uh, stays alive forever and ever and ever. Amen. But uh, you have the other artists. You've sent me and- artists for RadioWhat.com. I've played them on my station. I listen all day long to my station because I love it. I love the sounds that you're sending me and you're, you're, uh, you're talking about a level of professionalism. You have it. You have it. Heston Cleveland. You have it. Ricardo love and the indie hookup radio show has it in folds. Now that's enough praise for me. I'm going to let the, uh, the men's is here, uh, say some stuff. Uh, Heston Cleveland, give me an idea of what you do on the show. You know, uh, and you know how I met you. You know, people love to see what I do for my mom. And it's it's real, you know. I love my mom. And I could ask everybody this question. If your mom sounded like that, wouldn't you go as hard for her as I do? It's no question. 
you know, so I met people along the way, different artists, you know, I, of course, I share my mom's music and then they send me music. Since they listen to my mom's music, I listen to their music, to radio stations. And that's how I met you. You know, then you reached out and told me about what makes you famous. And, you know, we created a friendship. If no one could do what we do by ourselves. And at this time, man, I, I want to thank you for supporting me in our journey. You know, um, I found other people like that. Ricardo, he's like that. I got a lot of friends, you know, I'm online. I don't work. I, I, I do this for love. And the artists I met in my mom's journey, I got a knack for doing what I do. So I helped them. So that's how Heston's hits had got started. But I didn't have the tech savvy to do it by myself. So lo and behold, Ricardo, hell of an engineer, a producer, songwriter, and now a singer, which he said he could. Dan, do you believe this man said he couldn't sing? I, you know, I do a karaoke show every week, at least one a week, and I think everyone can sing at least a little bit, especially if I have the effects on my microphone. I add a little bit of echo, and it it, it fills out the sound a little bit. I mean, I don't add so much auto tune that it makes them sound like T Pain, but you know, I, I do I, I do add a little bit of echo to make people sound right. But depends on the on the type of song. Everybody sounds good singing a gospel song. Everybody sounds good singing a Christmas song. Everybody sounds good singing a certain type of song that's made for their voice. Now, Ricardo Love, how come you told that man you couldn't sing and you could sing? What happened? I didn't say I couldn't sing. I said I'm a music producer first, and I do what's called dummy vocals or reference vocals. So I didn't want to come out as an artist other than my dad's guitar project. I, I, hit, I produce all type of music, pop, hip hop, you know, whatever. But um, I made these songs so another artist um, could get the idea and sing and re-sing it. And so everybody kept telling me like, yo, you should put this out for but you know yourself. And I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of old school back in the day. Oh, you got to be a certain age. You got to have a certain look. You know, you got to hit a certain demographic and so on and so forth. So I'm thinking this old school thing, too, about marketing and promotion. And so I was like, hey, I'm too old to be doing that. You know, I, I'm a music producer. You know, so finally, um, Sabrina on KY10, she played, played my song, like, you know, without my permission. But she just played it. And I heard it. And I'm like, what the hell, this girl played my demo song as a regular song on her show. And it sounded good. So that gave me the inspiration. I'm like, okay, okay, maybe I can do this. And so I, I just said, well, you know, we got to not get any younger. I, I put it out. And we've been doing quite well. Numbers are going really good. Well, you know that this music business is an audio medium, first and foremost. Uh, so it doesn't matter what you look like. It, the, the problem came when MTV got really big and video killed the radio star because you had to not only have the chops to sing, but you had to be pretty and you had to have some kind of a, a video director that can make you look handsome on the big screen or the small screen. Either way, you know, I, I ever since the 80s, I'm a child of the 80s, class of 1986. So I was right smack dab in the middle of the music video age. I remember when MTV used to play music videos. But now when I go to a show, when I do my my club gigs, I'll put music videos up on the screen. So a lot of the artists that you have sent me uh, that you've been helping to promote have been up on the screen at the various clubs that I do. Sometimes when they let me play pick the music i pick all the artists that i've been talking to on the podcast all the fresh new artists that you've been sending to me on the emails if they got a music video even better if it's just a lyric video that's fine if it's a static picture that's fine too 
but I like when they have music videos. Uh, now, uh, have you had the the audacity, I guess, the the uh, courage to make yourself a music video on uh, of your songs, Ricardo Love? Three. Yeah, I have three videos, by the way. Uh, I have one for Drunk in an Uber, which is a special song, which is a, has a drunk driving campaign behind it, No Drinking and Driving campaign, and we're really trying to blow that up. And then I have one called Mia Moore, which is more of the jazz, um, Latin jazz, uh, R&B flavor. And then I have another one. Th- those two are already out on YouTube. The last one is... Ricardo. Yes, the last one is what? I'm a T. I'm a T. Every, every question he, he asks, he already knows the answer. That's, that's just to let you know. I have to give it to that man. He he been watching it. He does his research. I've been here too many times. <laughs> well, the thing is, just well, like gotta, just, just like you, you're very. I'm very seasoned. So I'm, I'm very seasoned. So I know how to how to speak to people. And if I'm, I have a curious a curious mind, and I like to stay engaged, whether I've done the research or not. Maybe, maybe a little, maybe not, but I'd like to know about the people that I'm talking to. So, Ricardo Love, I did not catch that last uh, video. You said that it's something that's coming out? Soulmate Level. That's called Soulmate Level, and that's a love song. And I employed my my other partner group called Black Nova. Him and his wife are the main um, love interest in there. Um, So they're... They're, they're, she's an actor and, and she, she did really well. So it's, it's a beautiful video. I'm looking forward to put that out very soon. Man, it all comes very circular because all these names, the Black Nova uh, force uh, that I've gotten to know over the, over the past year or so, maybe a little bit longer. It, it's just, it, it's amazing how it all comes full circle. I, I've noticed that you have a lot of jazz, but you're a seasoned uh, artist. I've talked to, to Cle- Cleveland, and I, I have an idea of who he is and where he's from. But who are you, and where are you from? Where Where did? Uh, hold on a second. Maybe I can get him back. I'm a, I'm, I'm originally from uh, Michigan. I grew up in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and I moved to New York when I was uh, 18 years old. Got signed to Polygram Records um, and got shelved immediately with another guy. We were like the Black Hall and Oats, if you remember them. And uh, but we didn't. They never put us out. They shelved us. That was back in the day when they could shelve you. And um, I stayed there two years. Then I moved to California with my bandmates from Michigan. Um, and I I've been back and forth to the Bay Area every two years. It seemed like for the last thirty something years. And now for the last two years, I've been in Las Vegas. So. I've been all over the place and, and doing this professional working with some platinum and independent artists, you know, every level. And I never just got that big, big break, but I work with right on the fringes of it. You know, Man, so Kalamazoo, I, for- Kalamazoo has its own, uh, its own stories. Uh, just the name Kalamazoo has been, what is that? That been like a, a was it a big show town? Was it vaudeville? What is it about Kalamazoo? Is it just the that the name is funny, or because it's been featured in a lot of things uh, that I've I've heard of from back in the back in the day, back, back in, in the thirties and twenties and thirties and stuff. Yeah, it was the old song called "I Got a Girl from Kalamazoo." That was one thing. Um, then they got from Walla Walla, Texas, to Kalamazoo, and we even got T shirts there called. Uh, Yes, there really is a Kalamazoo because they thought it was a made up city. And ironically, one of the biggest Pfizer, uh, it was Upjohn Medicine. They're in Kalamazoo and they, they, um, that, that, of course, that was a lot of money. So they, even though that was a small town, it had like four malls. Our high schools looked like junior college. We had, you know, tracks with four football stadiums with the announcers and now so it was a lot of money through that it sounded like a little hit town but it was a lot of money in kalamazoo it still is matter of fact kalamazoo uh has so much money they if you graduate from kalamazoo high school you get a free tuition to a college i'm not sure what level of college but 
It's called the Kalamazoo Promise. If you graduate from Kalamazoo schools, you, you get your colleges paid for. Yeah, I'm reading yeah. something about Kalamazoo right here, and it says something about it. it's home to Western Michigan University and Kalamazoo College and Kalamazoo mm-hmm. Valley Community College. I mean, hey, look, this mm-hmm. is this is part of your history, so I, I like putting that on the on the walking tour. You don't want to forget where you're from, uh, so, but to be from a city. Uh, you know, as fun named as Kalamazoo. I mean, what was it like like growing up there? It seems like it's not it such a small very, town. Very it's 73,000 people right now. Yeah, it's, it was a very diverse city. Like I said, a lot of money there. So the, it was a, a triple-A high school. We had two triple-A high schools. Um, I went to both of them. Um, and I, I ended up playing for Western Michigan University Gospel Choir. And also, I became a DJ in my senior year, kind of doing what you do, Dan. You you, uh, you remind me of a very professional DJ. You know, you're like top notch. And I, I was learning how to do that at Kalamazoo, WIDR, which is their college radio station. And I was going to get my license to be a, back then you had to have, a, I don't know if it's still, you had to have a broadcast license to, to be on the radio back then, you know. Yeah, I started uh, in 86. FCC. I think I had to have a some kind of an FCC license or I was underneath the 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 school's license when I started back in 86. When did you start on the radio? This is with my age, man. 82. <laughs> 82. Hey, we're not that far 82. apart, man. Yeah. Uh, you were doing radio in 82. Yes, you had to have an FCC license. I think nowadays uh, well, I mean, the the la- last radio stations that I was working at, it was underneath the uh, the license of the of the uh, the holder of the person who who owned the the um, the uh, radio station, and they were also responsible for paying all the artists. Uh, if you're paying, if you're playing music on the radio, uh, they have to pay uh, the um, the licensing uh, firms, whether it be ASCAP or or BMI or, or any of those. Uh, to try to get the artists paid. But for independent radio stations, for online radio stations, it's kind of the wild, wild west. You know, I have I have my online station. Supposedly the streaming is supposed to be uh, keeping track of the uh, the artists that I play, and hopefully they send their point zero 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 one cent, uh, half of that uh, to the artist when I play their songs. But, uh, hey, who knows? Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't keep. I can't keep track of that. I, I don't think there's a possibility that I can keep track of that. Uh, the the whoever's in charge of the FCC is it? Is it Colin Powell? No. Is it Michael Powell? Not not Colin Powell. His son Michael Powell is in charge of something up there. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's the Fed. It's sophisticated now. You can't even post your own music without it being picked up and saying. Uh, do you own the rights to this music and stuff? So it's kind of like a, a what's that Shazam, you know, built into everything now. So if your music is registered with a DS, oh, the internet, is, the internet is crazy today. It's acting bad, huh? Ricardo loves in the house. Let's see if we can get Heston Cleveland back. I don't hear a Heston. <laughs> Come on, internet, don't fail me now. We got left in Kalamazoo, Michigan, when last we spoke. Just a few short days ago, and through the magic of editing, we're back on the What Makes You Famous podcast. I guess we can finish up with Kalamazoo and how you got out of Kalamazoo and what you learned in Kalamazoo. Were you a musician back then? Were you uh, working Joe jobs, wearing hairnets and name tags, or were you uh, were you already fully fledged, fully uh, formed out there, Ricardo Love? I was a teenager. Um, I left when I was 18 years old. So I started playing guitar about 13. I was playing for, uh, I, you know, doing, funk was my main thing, right? But uh, there was this band in town, like an Earth, Wind & Fire type band, but they happened to play contemporary gospel. And I wanted to be in this band so bad. But, you know, I wasn't into the church back then. So they were playing for a church called, with a denomination rather, called Church God in Christ. If any, if anybody would know about that, that's the people who jump and holler and run down the aisles, and you know, it's one big party in church. And so, I end up playing for that church, and um, and then I end up playing for Western Michigan University Gospel Choir. And I met this young lady. Uh, she was about to graduate. I was. Uh, 
17 going on 18 and and she, she and we you know we had this about a year long relationship and she was graduating and she was from New York so from that I would I turned 18 and she wanted me to come to New York with her so <laughs> I went to New York and her mom mother was super religious and she wanted us to get married and I was 18 and she was 25 and I was like oh you know I was thinking that was so old when you're 18 you think 25 is old even so I was like I don't want to hold you up and you know uh, so I broke up with her like a fool and I was out there in, in, in New York trying to make it by myself and um um end up getting uh working for this this record store called Sam Goody's back then um, and uh, our manager happened to have a, a, an exec at Polygram Records. So we end up getting signed to Polygram Repor Records at 18 years old, and we got shelved, you know, and back then that's what they were doing. They don't do that too much anymore. And so he, he ended up working for Polygram. I would help him out, and I just kept playing with the church, and, um, you know, that's how I ended up in New York for a couple of years. Well, and explain explain like, for the listener, what is shelved? I mean, I have an idea, and I think my listeners are pretty smart. They know what kind of what shelved is, but uh, how far do you produce the album before they put it up on the shelf? Do you go all the way or what? It can, It could be one song. It could be a, an entire album. It could be you never even got in the studio. It could be four albums. You know, it's, it's, they didn't have a rhyme or reason. It's whatever those execs decided. So for us, I think we had about an album worth of materials. We were recording in Manhattan and these big, nice studios. And I just knew I made it. You know what I'm saying? I'm 18. And I remember going up to the Polygram offices, these big offices and stuff. And they usually don't take you up there unless they really mean some business with you. And um, But for whatever reason, and I tried to tell my guy, we were like the Black Hall of Notes, you know, if anybody is, the, is that's not too old for somebody. But uh, I, we needed a lead singer, and he wouldn't get one. And I, I knew that was going to be our, um, you know, our downfall, you know, or our weakness, rather. And I think that's why we got uh, shelved. At the same time, they signed Tony, Tony, Tony. And I think I have a theory, same company, Polygram. Uh, I think they put them out because they wanted that R&B sound, and that's what kind of what we had, that same... When I when I moved to it was kind of ironic when I moved to Oakland years later, I actually ended up um, being in the Wayne's from Tony Tony Tony's production crew for a short time. And everybody like, oh, you play like Tony Tony Tony. I'm like, man, I was playing like Tony 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 before I heard of who Tony 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 was, because that was that that guitar flavor that on the chords is a certain little trill you do, you know, that flavor. So. Yeah, yeah they had the right. they had the one hit. It feels good, but then they had. I mean, there was a whole lot more to Tony, Tony, Tony. And but you're talking about a band that didn't really have a lead singer. And I I know back in the '70s they had jam bands that would just play instrumentals. I mean, even Love uh, Unlimited and and uh, Earth, Wind and Fire and uh, you know Chicago. They had all these instrumentals. I mean, th sometimes you didn't even need to have a lead singer back in the 70s it was just people just grooving just you know doing whatever they were doing and just listening to those grooves and if you brought the funk you had parliament you know bringing that as well uh, you know you really didn't even need a lead singer until until the 80s you know when they were starting to think about a visual a front person to lead the thing speaking of visual on my screen i got heston cleveland finally showed up i'm so happy that the internet is kind of working out there in east oakland if he'll flip his camera sideways it'll show up real nice on my on my broadcast software but let, let's get a few words from heston cleveland i'm, I'm trying to uh, piece this together from the the last time that we were chatting and i i know that uh, we had some jokes about the hashtags that heston's using and and Heston had had praise for me, but I, all I can do is have praise for Heston. I was actually talking about you uh, with some people that I know, and and uh, I was saying, man, you started off bringing up your your mama, but then you ended up, you know, you're 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 continuing your story where you're building up other people as well as your mother. You have yeah, your mother is probably the driving force of how you got into the promoting business, but then there's other people that have come in and said. 
hey, you know what? You're you're pretty good at this promoting thing. Why don't you help me get my band, my my singing to the next level? And that's what Heston Cleveland does, uh, you know, along along with other people in the, in the group. But uh, Heston, uh, welcome back. We're getting here. <laughs> but better late than never. And and once again, uh, damn man, it, it's a, always an honor and a and a pleasure to be in the, in the company of you. you. Um, yeah, you know, you you kind of know my story. I uh, started promoting my mom's music because of a so-called faulty deal by an independent record label that my mom taught me to humble myself. And to say without them, we would not be here. You know, so through the trials and tribulations of promoting my mom's music with little, little monies, um, I met a lot of people in my promotional journey. So I decided to do what I could to help them. So... Later on, Ricardo and I, I, I'm jumping way ahead. Ricardo and I were talking and he was like, man, you know, a lot of independent artists. I'm like, yeah, such as yourself and his partner, Black Nova. They got a lot of good music. You know, you know the content, my friend. I send them every song I did, you got. Uh, so we decided to put something together. You know, we sat down and decided to start the Indie Hookup, where we'll showcase various artists per show and give a, a little indie tip of what we learned in our two journeys uh, along the way. And lo and behold, we're like not even three weeks in. We got, I just sent him the 10 episode of, of my favorites. Then the next one will be his favorites. You know, we got a few artists that we do themes. So the show is based around similar artists. And it's taken off. Well, that's just it. You start promoting uh, other people. You start helping other people. So people find out that that there's uh, there's help to be offered. You're going to get a following, and you have gotten a following. And I've already talked about the production value. Uh, you have a production value that that rivals any major uh, uh, radio station out there. I, I put it pound for pound for pound. Uh, you're going to get your money's worth on the indie hookup. Uh, listening to that show and it's made uh, just i mean it's already prepackaged. Uh, so any uh, uh, any radio station that needs a little air time to fill can just pop in that indie hookup right there maybe throw a couple of commercial spots here and there that are personalized for that radio station but there the the advantage is that the radio station is going to get a little uh, uh some time uh, to fill they're going to have some content out there now what we were talking about both of you have a story that is um that describes hardships this is primarily a a uh, learning podcast and uh you've already talked about heston the hardships that your mom had with her record uh, company, with her record deal, after the hits uh, kind of fell to the wayside, they just forgot about her. And then uh, Ricardo Love is talking about, you know, we usually don't talk about uh, specific brands, and I do invite the, the fine people of Polygram Records to rebut on this podcast if they want to say something uh, different. If they heard it differently, that's fine. But the, the story that I'm getting from Ricardo Love is that, hey, uh, you, you got signed and then you got put on the shelf. Uh, you got signed, but you did not get heard. So when people get signed to a record deal, they expect that their record company is going to help push them to the next level. Ricardo Love didn't get that love, so to speak. <laughs> It happens all. It happened all the time back then. They sat on people. It, it, you, you know, with all these podcasts, though, it's more stories are coming out. They said, "Oh, we signed with Diddy, and they 
had us five years sitting on us and this and that. So, you know, they promise you. Sometimes they keep on working with you, finance you to a certain extent or whatever. But uh, the thing now is because record companies are dying, all except for the major artists, even artists that were signed to labels are independent now. So we don't want to, we're trying to get out of the stigma just because you're independent, just because you're not signed, that the quality is less than. And I had a clip of Prince talking about this same thing, and I'm going to chop it up and put it on one of our indie tips. Because Prince, before he died, he was an independent artist. And a whole lot of other artists that we're meeting are now independent artists, you know. Yeah, the man had to change his name to a symbol to get out of his record deal. And then he went independent. Now, you're talking about shelving stuff. I heard a story, and I know this probably has nothing to do with it, but Prince, I, w- I already had that in my head when you were talking about these big-name artists that uh, go independent. But he likes to shelve things. Before he was, uh, before his uh, demise, um, he had a, a movie. Kevin Smith tells this story, and I know this is not my story to tell, so I'm going to paraphrase it, that uh, he made a whole movie for Prince, and Prince said, you know, paid him, and said thank you very much and then promptly put the the uh the film on the shelf never to be seen hopefully some of that archive and i'm sure that kevin smith wasn't the only uh, person that made a film for prince or made music for prince that has never been heard hopefully some of that music gets heard now you were talking about earlier that that doesn't happen that often people are thirsty for content there's so much streaming there's so much uh, there's so many ways that an independent could put their music out there. SoundCloud, uh, YouTube. There, there's some of these artists that have made it big putting their music on SoundCloud and YouTube and CD Baby and some of these other. Uh, I mean, what what places do you put your music, uh, Ricardo Love, that, that gets the most, well, I'm going to keep on doing it, the most love, the most uh, ears? W- where do you get the most satisfaction uh, when you put your music out there, Ricardo. Well, when you sign up for like a a, a, a distributor, which is uh, these days could be as simple as uploading your, you know, it's not like a process you got to be approved by a record company or whatever. It's just CD Baby, TuneCore, uh, is is about ten major ones and a whole bunch of other ones. You sign up and they distribute your music to Spotify, iTunes, all the all the other, uh, you know, uh, Deezer, all these places. And and the problem is, and that's why the indie hookup was created. Also, is that okay? Now you got a record out, you got a do- you got an album out, but it just sits there. Most most people who release, they're not thousands a year that's released now. Nowadays, because of the the technology that you can make an album on your phone. Matter of fact, there's some a major rap artist that made his entire album on his phone, and he actually has. I think, I wish you know I'm I'm not keeping up with the the name. He's one of these mumble rappers but he made the whole album on his phone and it's got major numbers uh, there's thousands per day so you have to stand out and um most independent artists are if you go to their spotify which is one one of the few places where you could see how many people play this record because it doesn't give it away on other platforms like it does spotify so spotify would kind of like tell how popular you are, how many monthly listeners you are, how many, if your song is even above a thousand plays, it doesn't even, it just shows this less than symbol. <laughs> it's kind of, it's like there, <laughs> you know, and it doesn't have anything to do with quality. It's some of the best music you never heard on these, like SoundCloud and Spotify and stuff. And it just, it's sad. So the indie hookup, we're providing this opportunity for people to get heard. Already people are reporting once they got heard on our, um, our platform and i'm sure it happens to you dan you know all of a sudden their numbers go up a little bit but that's just one thing so you got to keep doing all this thing all this promotion and all there's all these success stories like on tiktok and this and that but for every one success story just like it was with the majors there's thousands of others that don't do it so it's about heston always talking about consistency he's the guy he's a he's a king of consistency he always on on all these platforms you know you would think he's an older guy doing it every platform is promoting like crazy well tell me heston how do you stay so consistent uh with your uh, do you just spend all day on that computer on that laptop on that phone uh tweeting 
I, you you know, Dan. Um, first of all, the consistency comes from the love of my parents and the love of our story. You know, I got a book that's almost finished called 45 Years in the Making, The Rebirth of Carrie Cleveland. My mom and dad toured all up and down California. Uh, they both had jobs and music was their, their love, their hobby. And they had a following, you know, uh, pretty big for the time. Uh, you know, now social media kind of takes it a, a, another step. But m when my parents played, people came to see them. So my story is my father made all the music. He wrote the lyrics, played every instrument one at a time, four track and a half track. They did the acoustics in the bathroom and the quality, you know, is above and beyond expectation. So it's my, my mom sounds good. And at 83 years old, she still sounds good. Yeah. So I, I want to share our story to the world. It's a love story that my mom and dad loved each other. They had the common love of music and they loved me and I loved them. So my job is to tell this story. I was blessed to have my mother and father in my life to the point that they got married twice. And in the second wedding, I was the best man. There's not too many stories like that anymore. So I'm just sharing it to the world, you know. And by good chance, Ricardo Love is a part of that story. Now, we could do a whole nother interview talking about how we met. You know, this thing is bigger than us, Dan. It's, the whole story is bigger than us. We're here today because of my mom's legacy. Well, oh, let me correct that, my dad's legacy. So all the love that's been given to me, I'm giving it back the best way I can by helping indie artists. I don't have the technology that Ricardo has. Ricardo is the body and the engine of the indie hookup. I'm the A&R and face. I talk. You know that. <laughs> I well, talk. You just mentioned you don't need to have uh, technology. You don't need to have uh, the the ability to to run computers like uh, these computers eventually are going to take off. You were talking about your dad going old school. Once again, you're teaching people, giving people gems. All these kids uh, that think that uh, press a button on their computer and uh, turn on that microphone and that's all they need. No, no. Your dad is scouting locations that are giving you the best acoustics. They didn't have reverb that you could hit with a button. They had to go into a bathroom. Oh, that sounds pretty good in this bathroom. Uh, you're recording things in churches. And, you know, I was talking to Ricardo and he said that he was part of, uh, you know, got involved with the church group. So, you know, in churches, you got really good acoustics. Uh, for certain quality. And so uh, you, you scout locations rather than having a little button go beep, boop, boop, and there you go. Now, you, you're, you've, anybody that's listened to this podcast already knows Heston Cleveland's story about his love for his parents, for sure, for sure. But what we got to know, I mean, we got time. Let's find out how Heston Cleveland and Ricardo Love, uh, how did you guys meet up and where was that and when was that? Ricardo? Yes, sir. You go ahead. You got more pieces than I do. <laughs> okay. Um, 
during our comeback, you know, my 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 mother's record was reissued, you know, and uh, I'm thinking, man, this is, this is a story, you know. So Naru reached Naru Quina, an old friend of mine, saw us on the news. And I forgot how he got in touch with me, but he reached out and re re reminisced on growing up because I've been knowing him for over 30 years. He invited us to a Juneteenth function where he was performing. So, you know, you uh, go meet, meet him, meet up with him meet his circle of friends, and just so happened, K.E. Durham, which is one half of Black Nova Entertainment. Ricardo is the other half. So K.E. and I start talking, you know. He says, oh, man, you know, I'm a, a musician. And, of course, you know, I told him about my mom's story. And he had heard a little bit about about us from the root. So he was like, man, you know, I want to um, share some stuff with you. So, you know, I shared my mom's music. He shared his music. And I went home and I looked at the video and I'm like, hey, this is this is pretty good, you know. So, um he had reached back out to me. He said, man, you know, I was thinking I would love to do some music with your mom. Sure. Okay. So we went to the studio and Ricardo had just moved. So K.E. was always on the phone with him. Always. I mean, I need help with this and I need help with that. So in between that, Ricardo and I, we started talking. You know, then I had a friend that had a studio in Las Vegas. I flew out there for a wedding. And uh, I said, man, I know an engineer, you know, that's pretty good. So I had never physically saw Ricardo or talked to him, but listening to his music, and he just so happened to be down in Vegas. Those two, they met. So in return, Ricardo offered his services for my mom, where he remixed four songs, right, Ricardo? Yeah, yeah. You know, so I was very grateful. Ricardo and I just kept talking. K.E. decided to do the video, High Beams. So Ricardo flew out, you know, and we hung out all day, had a good time. So we just kept talking, and the Indy hookup was born. Well, Cleveland, uh, you know, Heston, I'm very appreciative of having you in my circle of friends, man, because you have introduced me to so much good music, including your mom's music. As long as I've been doing this, I never knew about a Carrie Cleveland until I met Heston Cleveland, which is great. I mean, that I mean, I'm sorry that it's been so long, but I, I'm so happy that I know it now. Now, tell me. Ricardo Love. I used to remix a lot of music when I was uh, when I was a kid, and I used to uh, you know uh, sample a bunch of music when I was in. Uh, not supposed to be doing that, you know, but uh, you know, sample the beats and and play the uh, the track so so that way the MC could rap over it. But tell me about your idea of remixing uh, Carrie Cleveland's music, and you know why did you pick uh, these certain songs, or were these songs that were out there? I mean, because you got to have uh, clean vocals, as far as I know, to do a, a good remix. Or, or you know, what, tell me about the process of how you remix. Yeah, that. so I'm, I'm old, older like you, Dad. We used to take the MPC and other samplers, Akai uh, samplers, and, and and basically you would have to have that background music inside of it too, and maybe you would EQ it enough so it, you know, the the vocals would be prominent. Maybe the you know 
uh, EQ the, the kick up out of it and stuff, and you would just have to do with that, and maybe you would just use a part of it, you know, like we, James Brown was sampled the hell out of. But now they got this these new softwares that will actually rip a clean um, stem from it, like Serato and Rip X, and um, even even some of the other programs like Cubase can rip rip the actual vocals. So I happened to find. He sent me several ones because we talked about it because another person had did one already like the old school. He basically took a piece and just used it as the hook. What I did was take her entire lyrics and and just like I had her masters and put new entire new music behind it. Her dad's, uh, I mean, Heston's dad's music was fantastic, but we wanted to give another version for this generation. So... I was able to get clean rips on four songs. So a couple of other ones I really wanted to do, but the frequencies were crossing over too much and I couldn't get those. So I found the four cleanest ones I could find. And we really just gave it a whole new life. And um, only one of them, like with Naru, was a brother he mentioned earlier. Me and Naru Kwana, we do something called Hip Science where we take music and teach science with it. He'd probably be another person you would really want to interview if you haven't already. But so that's how this cross, we like, you know, people know each other, six degrees, two degrees of separation. And so, um, yeah, that's how that came with it. I got I got a clean, cleanest version. Actually, I think the rip version sound cleaner because I was able to run it through a vocal chain and I was able to do all this technical stuff, too. And I, man, we got some really good vocals from her. And she's singing in verses all the way through, not just like this little chop up, you know, kind of thing. Every, every now and then I had to chop it and shift it back into to the beat because, that you know, real drums don't lock like um, MIDI drums do. So, I, you know, I would have to shift it back in there. But I. It sounds like she's in the room with me, you know. Oh, I have had the pleasure of uh, of uh, talking to Naru Kuna. I had a lot of fun with his last name too. Kuna. <laughs> yeah, it sounded like I was doing karate uh, after a while saying his name. But l- let me tell you, man, you're you're talking about b- building up an audience and and maybe giving a, a, a creative license, giving the creative license of an engineer, a good a good produce, a producer, a good remixer. You could take. Uh, a song from this genre and make it into an entirely different genre. Uh, you know, being from Miami, I was doing a lot of uh, dance remixes and freestyle remixes of songs from the seventies and from the eighties. A lot of times these artists, you know, once they, they find out that you're a good remixer, they will send you their clean vocal tracks and say, Hey, this is originally a country song. Can you make it into something else? Yeah, I'll make it into a dance song. I'll make it into a rock song. I'll make it into whatever. And I'll take just that little bit of the song and make that the hook, even though this was the hook. You know, uh, this a song, uh, you know, uh, jamming when worlds collide was the, the original. But then you find another little piece of the song that was pretty interesting and you re- repeat that, repeat that over and over. And then it could find a whole nother audience and then, and then the people are going to look back on the catalog of that artist and they're going to go, huh, that artist does this kind of stuff too. And this kind of stuff. I'm interested in all that. If you listen to radio, what.com, you're, you're going to hear all kinds of genres. A, a, a DJ usually doesn't listen to one type of music. I'm sure fellas, you guys don't listen to one type of music. Just like people are very complicated. People are very, very, um, uh, got different layers to them different you know some days you want the blues some days you want some rock some days you want r&b some days you're going hip-hop some days you're going you know rap uh metal oh my gosh can't hear too much of that uh, i'm sorry to my metal listeners but sometimes the metal just hurts my head <laughs> but uh no there's uh, there's and sometimes i'll listen to japanese music and, and music from around different countries and stuff oh my gosh it's music as long as the chord progressions are there, it's going to have a melodic tune to your ear. And correct me if I'm wrong. You guys are like way, way more talented in the music business. But I feel like music is universal. And I've heard that before. And I know you've heard it as well. Anyone, anyone, what are your thoughts on any of this? Universal. That's why Heston, through his uh, meeting other people, actually reached out internationally we're 
uh, my Indian friends. And then, uh, so we did, a, we're on our second international show where we just use people that are not from the United States. That's how, you know, far the reach is gone. And, and you're right, music transcends language. There's a couple of songs in there that weren't even speaking English in parts. And, um, you know, or they had such a heavy accent, you couldn't even understand what was going on. But the music translates over all languages and, you know, hits the heart. So definitely. Man, I, li- I put some music on there on, on the radio station that I'm running here. Uh, um, and some of it is not in English. And I'm hoping I hope I'm not cursing anybody out with this music, but it just sounds so good. <laughs> there's some dance tracks. There's some like R&B. There's some rock songs. That are in other languages. I think there's some like Arabic stuff and some that's like Indian, a Hindu. Uh, you know, I, I put it on there because, man, that just sounds so neat. Uh, and the 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 chord progression, the way that the melody hits my hits me in the head and in the heart and the feels, it's it's so good. Now, Heston, I don't know if we ever talked about this. I know that people put their music in movies. Have you ever put your music out there in in the movies and uh, you know mom's music in the movies or or television shows or commercials? Have you tried to to I think there's a a service called Sync that they put their music in. Have you tried any of that? And we were blessed to be able to get a song in a Netflix series. Love will set you free is on a show called Glitter. It's a it's a foreign uh uh series, but my mom's music is on episode two, the first season. Um it's it's um unbe- but you know it's unbelievable. I sit down 1978, you know, running back and forth to the use the bathroom out in the backyard. Never thought 45 years later I would see my mom uh, on TV, a, a, a song in a Netflix series. Uh, by the time we hang up, we'll be at 2 million streams on Spotify. She's got 30,000 monthly listeners. uh, Ricardo, yes, yes, today, 20, 29 something. So I'm just giving it a little change and calling it 30 monthly listeners. I got a, I got an album I'm looking at right now. That's 45 years old, barely any fingerprints, and it's worth $639. And I go in there in the other room and look at that little lady and just shake my head. No one would have ever have thought that life would become what it has become for us. My mom has a a great following and I'm doing my best to bring other artists that are just as good or even better. Um, and I think you got all of Ricardo's music. I'm pretty sure I have quite a bit of it. I have, uh, at least man, I have stacks of your mom's music, but you're, you're talking, Oh yeah. my goodness. You're talking about, music that has been uh, that it that transcends you're talking exactly what ricardo said it transcends language it transcends uh generations but you said that your mom was on, on glitter episode two but she was she was her image on there as well no oh okay no it's it, it's just like we have a we have a video yes on youtube it's called Northern Soul Girl Dancing. It's my mom's music and it's over I think it's 800,000 views now. 
I mean, my mom, if you if you listen to my mom and then you hear it again, you know it's her. She has a unique voice. Uh I keep I keep telling her that and she she doesn't believe it when it's from me, you know, because I'm her son. But I can step out of that box and just listen to it because I love music. You know, I'm like, this voice is beautiful. Not because it's my mom, because it's beautiful. And then, you know, like to feed off of what you and Ricardo were talking about, uh, we did an episode number nine. No United States music. Nothing from the States. We got one from Portugal, one from Ghana, one from Jamaica, uh, a few from the UK, all over the world. And I've listened to it. I listen to it until we do the next one. So I've been playing it over and over and over. Now here's and I look at the views. What was that? No, no. Here's a, a, a thought that I had. You said that you have this album in front of you that you're treating like art. After a while, time it become it, it makes your your art your music your album into a commodity into an art an art piece. So it's, it's worth over six hundred dollars. You know that. It's is always subjective. Uh, how much is someone willing to pay? The only thing is, I'm very sad for the record album itself because albums are meant to be played. You're supposed to put those things on the turntable, drop the needle, and listen to that. But you say that there's hardly any any. Uh, you you got to keep some uh, back. Like I know they do that with comic books and art. Uh, don't put your fingers on it because it stays more valuable. Time. Uh, plus distance, yeah, I guess it all it equals uh, commodity and value. What do you think about that, Ricardo? Love, do you have you have uh, stuff that you've recorded years ago that you're gonna hold on to and uh, and and use it like art rather than uh, uh, create the um, uh, rather than content? Vinyl back in the day, uh, and and then it went to cassettes. <laughs> I had a couple of those. Then it went to CDs. I tried to hold on to this stuff as long as I can. And I swear, I'd be hard-pressed to find anything now. And that's a damn shame. Um, that's what happens when you your mother passes away. You know, you had that foundation house that everybody had their own childhood stuff and stuff like that. So, unfortunately, I don't have that. A good thing, there is a movement to reprint vinyl. That's what we're thinking about doing with Heston's mother stuff. And there's even new artists that are printing their stuff on vinyl because there's nothing like that sound. And this is, it, you know, even uh, Walden Books, I think it is, they selling uh, records, record players. And, you know, so hopefully that will continue. It seemed like it kind of died down, but hopefully that'll, uh, that trend of having a physical thing, because you, you know, Dan, back in the day, this is another sad part of it. You used to get an album cover, even a CD, and you would read the credits and it would say lead guitar, rhythm guitar, and keyboards by, and produced by, and what studio was it? And that was part of the journey of, of a music appreciation. Now, you know, recently I've been putting out artists and the, uh, the DSP, they won't even, they only allow the artist's name and the name of the song. You can't even put the producer's name. You can't even put who played what. It's, it's ridiculous. Unless they're a feature, you have to put featured like, um, on Kerry Cleveland, they have featured Naru Kwana. But I couldn't put my name, even though I was also featured on there. You know what I'm saying? It, it's just really sad. So I'm wondering, like, what the hell are they going to do 10, 20, 30 years from now? Like, who played that? Who was that? Who, you know, only the artist and the and the name of the song. It's, it's, so it's kind of sad. Well, working on that. different radio stations over the years, I would grab, you know, I would account on having uh, an album with uh, liner notes that not only gave me the, the the song lyrics, but also gave me stories about the artists that were playing on those on those songs. Because you would see, 
Uh, a lot of times, well, if you went to Stax Records or you went to uh, to uh, Motown and you or you went to uh, even I don't know any a lot of the the major uh, record labels of the of the sixties and seventies, it would be the same artists, the same uh, uh, musicians playing on so many different albums. It, you know the the hired guns. You know that they, they you know the singers. And the songwriters would show up to the uh, to the studios, and they they'd say, "Oh, we don't need your band. All we need is the singer, because we have an in house band that knows, uh, you know, knows our our style, knows our equipment, and knows how to put things together." So it was like, you know, I remember the story of the the monkeys. Uh, Davy Jones, the lead singer of the monkeys, showed up, and he and you know the these guys were put on TV. They didn't know how to play music. But they learned how to play music so they can do their their album. Well, they showed up and they said, uh, Mike Nesmith, uh, Peter Tork, and and uh, you know, just you guys can all leave. Uh, all we need is Davy Jones with his with his vocals. I mean, and you don't know that if you don't have the liner notes. I guess what what are we going to count on? Uh, Wikipedia, maybe uh, that'll have the, uh, the this song was made back in nineteen ninety nine. And these were the people that were credited on it. I mean, I guess that that's what I'd have to use rather than getting an album and looking at liner notes. I'd have to look up the Wikipedia, right? Yeah, that the, one of the things we we insist on doing because even some of the stations that will give independent artists or other songs, they'll just play it, and you'd be like, "Wow, that was a great song. Who was that? Where can I get that?" So we on uh, on the indie hookup, we always say, "This is this artist and." And we do that every song. It, it might sound a little irritating in between, but I try to put a little entertaining thing on it, you know. And and so every song is announced who it is and what the name of the song is, so they could um, they could go and get it. And then we feature on our website. We feature some of the artists that we're playing. I guess in the near future, we'll try to get everybody's link and 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 get them connected more. But you should be able to find it just by the name of the artist and the song. And then what's that program you use, Heston? Uh, because I am. Kazam should be able to find it too, you know. Kazam's getting pretty good. I know in, in the in early times it, it wasn't good. Sometimes I would put uh, all my stuff through Windows Media Player uh, to try to get get make sure that I had the ID tags named because uh, you know when I play the songs, I try to tweet them out. I try to get them out there, and then I do have a whole featured artist page, and then all the links have individual pages for my featured artists, but I'm only one guy really that's putting this all together. I'm trying uh, to, to help people out. I'm glad I have this podcast that I'm able to, Hey, maybe get a couple more ears on Ricardo love and Heston Cleveland and the indie hookup because the indie hookup show. And you know, Hey, I could be really mad that there's a, that, that there's a really good show, but I'm not really mad. I'm really happy that there's a show that's promoting independent artists, that these artists don't have to sell their soul, figuratively speaking, uh, to the company store to get their, uh, to get a couple dollars that they could pay their rent. You know, they, they might be able to, to make it uh, on their own, on independent, uh, w- you know, with shows like the Indie Hookup that will play their music and get more ears. Now, you say your mom had, uh, you know, millions of hits. And what does that translate into dollars? I always worry, you know, because I've heard the stories of Spotify getting, oh, there's millions and millions of, of listeners and streams and this thing's been hit. And I made uh, $3.25 on my check last month. You know, it doesn't account for much. I'll say, I'll say we were getting four figures. But, you know, uh, that's on not just Spotify, of course, YouTube, iHeart, Deezer, Bandcamp, Tidal. That's everything. Pays point zero zero three two five per spin. Now... You imagine splitting that with a record label. The artist gets pixie dust. You know, um, 
Spotify is an ego thing. You know, um, I got a million streams. Yeah, I feel good until the check comes. <laughs> Well, the one thing it does do is it it does give you that exposure. Okay, I know when I first started in this business, they they people would pay me pennies, uh, and hey, but this is a good show. There's going to be a thousand people there. It's good exposure. Well, exposure doesn't pay your your car note. Exposure doesn't pay your rent. Exposure doesn't put that food on your table. Exposure is one thing, but my goodness, man, you need to get paid for your blood, sweat, and tears. People are getting entertained. The people need to be entertained. Uh, you, know, the, you know, there's a reason the entertainment business makes so much money uh, because the entertainers are very talented and humans want that content. They want that that release. You can't uh, work nine to five all day long and just uh, in quiet, you know, always I, look, I, I have a little iPod in my ear or little headphones in my ear and I'm either listening to music or I'm listening to podcasts. And uh, thankfully, with the indie hookup, now I'm listening to both. It's like a, a music podcast. It's pretty good, man. But um, you know, hey, I, I don't know. It, it, I'm just. I hope that people are getting the satisfaction. People are getting return on their investment. ROI, return on investment. That's what what I learned back in the '80s with the stock markets and all that. You know, people wanting wanting their cash. You know, there's a. There's a reason that people work. It's it's so they can, you know, if they if they have something of value, they want to get that return on that value. Yes, you you're an artist, you do it because you love it, but hopefully you can make a living at it. You know, people end up make you know, having to work for fast food, which is not a bad thing. I'm you know, I'm glad there's fast food because sometimes I I like to get a little burger on the road, but uh you know, to in order to make and in, in order to be able to 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 uh, make the music that you love, you gotta you know work nine to five for something that you don't like so much. Ugh, that's frustrating. It's just frustrating. These are the thoughts that come out of my head when I talk to talented people like yourselves, Ricardo Love. I mean, are you? Did, have you been making it in the music business? Is this your only thing, or are you? Uh, I mean, do you have something that that some other offer to the community? So, Heston is wearing a. That um on his shirt. That's for I'm the company that I work for that we met that he introduced me to, and that's what he was alluding to earlier. Uncle Mario Total Media. I've been working for him for the last two years, and that's my full time job. I do. I'm a music producer, music engineer, and we do podcasts. We're starting to do film, and we do with our music videos. Um, the, speaking of music videos, I got a song out called "Drunk in the Uber" now, which is a whole thing. And that ties into what you're talking about, what I had to do before. I was an Uber driver for for, for almost seven years to try to have some flexibility to go to L.A. and do shows, to come back to the Bay and do shows and so on and so forth. So luckily for the last couple of years, um, I've been able to do just media, just just, you know, just what I love doing um, for Uncle Mario and then Black Nova, we, Black Nova Entertainment. And then uh, Hess, I'm working with Hess now and uh, Grassroots and, um, excuse me, <laughs> um, what's the name of your company, sir? East Oakland. <laughs> the, East Oakland Music East Oakland Management. Music Management. East Oakland Music Management. I see in the tree like it's an Oakland symbol. That's where we get that from. So um, working with these companies and even that rule, you know, it, it's keeping me just doing music, but, you know, it's hard out here in these music streets, so I might have to go back to, you know, like when the uh, Indy racing, what is it, not Indy, but Formula One came out here, I had to take a little thing and get some extra money. So we artists do what we got to do. Man, you, you go know? from Uber to Formula One? What? No, I, I know that I was between jobs one time, and I, I drove a cab for about six months. I was a terrible cab driver. I, I didn't hurt anybody, but I always had to get off work early so I can get to my gig on time because I was like, uh, you know, I can make $50 a day driving this cab or I can make, you know, a few hundred at night, you know, playing this music for people. And so uh, so I was like, uh, I need to get off early, boss. 
And then eventually he just couldn't take it anymore. And he was a friend of mine at the cab company. He says, you know, I got to let you go. And I go, that's fair. That's absolutely fair because I, I keep leaving an hour, two hours early. And I know that the next driver, you know, with these cabs, uh, when they drive, they don't stop. It's the same cab, you know, from seven to seven, it's this cab driver. And then from seven to seven, it's the next cab driver. And that, that cab hardly gets turned off except for an oil change and a gas fill up. And that's it, man. But, uh, hey, I'm with you. I, I mean, I, I feel for you driving an Uber. I think Uber's probably a little more flexible than uh, working seven to seven. But still, you know, driving people around, it's uh, it's kind of it's kind of iffy sometimes. I, I, I don't know. There, there's probably a whole other podcast with uh, uh, Uber, Uber cab confessions. <laughs> <laughs> Uber though that drunken Uber is a very it's called play this song save a life campaign that we got going um, because being an Uber driver I saw firsthand not only with the drunk people getting in my car and getting them home safe but you know being on the road so much I see accidents on the side of the road caused by drunk drivers so this whole it's a really fun song and it's a party anthem but it has this met covert message that you know if hey, go ahead and party have a good time drink but call it Uber, call it Rideshare. So we, we got a whole campaign going with that going now. Hulu commercials are about to come on. And and unfortunately, I got that song in there because I'm just another artist um, if it wasn't for that song. But I believe in that song. And I think that song is going to have a life of its own. Its own and it's going to be like a phrase, uh, hopefully a viral phrase. Hey, I was drunk in an Uber last night. You know, so that whole movement where we had you know saving lives with that one song yeah the content is you know when you're making music when you're writing songs it's what you're thinking about and it could tell a story it could save a life uh, now i work at bars every week you know I, I do uh dj work at bars every week but before that years ago i was a firefighter uh, so i used to sweep those uh, poor drunk people that didn't fare so well off the streets you know, and sometimes I'd put them in an ambulance and then I started working at a hospital in the emergency room. So I saw what happened after I dropped them off at the hospital in the ambulance. So it was, uh, it was eye opening, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, here's my public service message. Don't drink and drive. Okay. All right. Get yourself an Uber, get yourself a Lyft, get yourself an old fashioned cab and, and get yourself home. Uh, don't worry. You can come back and get your car the next day. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, public service messages all around. All right, man. Shoot. We got to wind this thing down. I mean, the, the biggest thing is go check out the indie hookup uh, radio show on your YouTube. Is that is that all where it's at? Is that it's only on YouTube right now? I mean, I, I, and you you are syndicating a little bit, right? You are putting it out on the radio stations or are you asking that it be put on radio stations? Tell them where it's at, Hester. It's on iHeart. Deezer, uh, YouTube, uh, My Indie Radio in France, KYBM Radio, um, Radio in, I believe, Atlanta. And I'm here talking to the man, hoping he got some love for us. I, I think I might have some room <laughs> at some point. Get, uh, nah, I got some, I got some room on radio what.com and that that'll be nice, man. We'll we'll definitely talk about a, a date and a time where I can uh get the uh get the track, the MP three and throw it up on, on the internet. It's really nice having uh the a ability to get the music that I like. If I like the music, I'm gonna put it on that radio station. And and I, I like all kinds of music. People that listen for an hour go, man, there was a lot of different genres. It started back in the 70s, and it went all the way to, like, yesterday, uh, music that just came out. So I, I like that. I, I like that you're, you're building up uh, people that have been putting the work in. <laughs> I heard the, the word overnight success. People that go, oh, you were an overnight success. You made it made it big. Yeah, that overnight took uh, 10 15 years, 20 years to become successful. You said you were playing guitar since you were 13. I mean, when did you actually make it big uh, in your in your uh, idea of uh, making it in the music business, Ricardo Love? Uh, 
<laughs> I don't think I ever made it. I mean, but I, I played on the big stages. I won all these music awards in L.A. I played, I, I we produced, co-produced with platinum people. People, you know, won Grammys and so on and so forth. But I never got that big thing. I've got my music uh, as a there's a main theme song on TV shows and all of that. So I, I've made it in one sense, but in as a household name, not yet. But I got one last shot with this drunk in the Uber and this song called Mia Moore. Hey, I, I still got life, and we making our own opportunity. Well, the we, thing is, it's a, it's a hustle. Own- yeah, it's a hustle. Yeah. And and it's like um all right, character actors versus major movie stars. Yeah, the major movie star will make 10, 15, 20 million per movie, okay? But then you got character actors, which are the rest of the people that'll make little money. A little money. A little money, enough for rent, enough to get yourself a pool, buy yourself a car, buy yourself this, buy yourself that. Little money to keep you going character actors i think that's where we're likening ourselves look we're not going to make that uh, radio djs there's probably a handful maybe two handfuls that make a million a year uh, most of the other djs minimum wage 10 15 a, a, an hour maybe you know and and that's just the way it is but you can live live simply live live right and you can make that work right yeah, if you if you're happy from your art, then that's being rich in another way. You got that right. Then it's never work. It's never work if you love it. That's right. All right. Well, let's close this thing up, man. We I've had a pleasure ch- chatting with you. I mean, I know we had to do this in two parts, but I, I think it's I think it sounds pretty good. We finally got it all together. Um, let's. Uh, you can give some shout outs to people that have helped you along the way, and then we'll do some last words. Cle- uh, Heston Cleveland, give those uh, shout outs if you have any anybody that you'd like to thank for a minute. Yes, sir. First of all, my friend, I have to thank you. I I love what you're doing. I'm watching you. I see you watching me, but I'm go above and beyond anything you know the love you have for for everything i've done you you help me so my first shout out is to you then of course i got to shout out the buku family that's a a part of another group that we didn't get to talk about but uh my mom f- fell in love with them i fell in love with them we have history. Uh, shout out to K.E. Durham, Black Nova. Shout, shout out to Earl Gar, Uncle Mario, Total Media. And shout out to my co-host, Ricardo Love. Oh, and shout out to Just Chat with Bree. Yes, you really, you <laughs> All right, Ricardo, out. give some so shout outs. Everybody get that one in there. Ricardo Love, give some shout outs. Yeah, hey, we we shout out the same people because we we got on this same um, network. But yeah, we but just chat with Bree in the Bay Area. That's a terrestrial radio, meaning that they transmit over the regular old school antennas, and of course they do online as well. And this coming week, we're gonna be on the on the air with them, taking that morning slot every day. So that's real big for us. That was a dream that I had back in Kalamazoo when we talked about the DJ thing that I didn't get my license that one year. So I, I got my, that's one dream, Dan. I came true. I'm on the radio. Hey, Mama, I'm on the radio. <laughs> so, yeah. So shout out to just chat with Bree and um, everybody that Kess said and um, the indiehookup.com. I n d y. We don't spell i n d i e. We spell i n d y. The indiehookup.com. Check us out, and you can click on your favorite link to where you like to listen from there. All right. Uh, Heston, Cleveland, you know I finish these things off with last words for the people. Since I've talked to you the most, I'll give you the first last words for the people. Then Ricardo Love will do the final, final words. So Heston, Cleveland, this could be words to live by, something you heard a long time ago, a mantra that you wake up with every morning, or whatever pops into your head at this moment in time. Heston, Cleveland, give the last words for the people. Consistency. Always stay consistent. Never give up 
on what you believe in, dreams come true. All right, that's well said. We're Ricardo Love, last words for the people, something you heard a long time ago, a mantra you wake up with every morning, whatever pops into your head at this moment in time. Ricardo Love. Okay, learn to love yourself because if you don't love yourself correctly, you can't love nobody else correctly. Well, there you have it, party people. Two really cool dudes, Heston Cleveland and Ricardo Love of the Indie Hookup, amongst other things. But that's what they're putting their effort into right now. That seems to be the the, the way to go. What has progressed? I mean, it started it started off, uh, you know, as as light production, as light uh, promotion. And now they're putting their full force into some heavy promotion and making sure that the indie artists uh, get the hookup, the indie hookup, if you will. Uh, it's a perfect name. It's a perfect name for what they're doing because it, it t- says exactly what they're doing. They're, they're hooking up ears and eyes and, you know, feelings, uh, you know, people that are putting out uh, music and, and aren't getting all the love that they need. And uh, they're making sure that they get that that love, that promotion uh, on the Indie Hookup, uh, indie ho- the indie hookup dot com that has all the links. But there's also links in the show notes below. So check those out. You can click on them. You can follow Heston Cleveland and Ricardo Love uh, individually and you can r- follow the Indie Hookup uh, as a whole. Uh, I have the links below. Ah, that's it for this edition of What Makes You Famous. If you, yes, you, I'm turning my attention to you. If you'd like to tell your story, I encourage you to give me a call, 501-470-6386, or email keysdan at aol.com. That's it for me. It's keysdan, radiowhat.com, djlittlerock.com. Peace. I'm out of here.